It is now my privilege to introduce the General Director of Kentucky Opera, Ian Deere. Director Deere's love of opera began as a member of the Children's Chorus in Tosca for Charlotte Opera, now Opera Carolina. After completing a Bachelor of Music degree in voice and performance from the Medal School of the Arts at Southern Methodist University, an internship with Dallas Opera brought him to Santa Fe Opera as production assistant in 1996. He also worked as a freelance assistant director and stage manager for Santa Fe Opera, Atlanta Opera, Opera Carolina, Opera Pacific, and Washington Opera, learning opera production from the ground up. Ian joined the staff of New York City Opera in 2004 as rehearsal and music coordinator. Two years later, he moved to Lyric Opera of Chicago, starting as rehearsal administrator and moving up to director of production and head of the rehearsal department. He spent eight seasons at the Lyric Opera of Chicago with one summer as rehearsal director for Santa Fe Opera. Before coming, becoming general director of Kentucky Opera, he was artistic administrator of the Dallas Opera. Now, if you would, please join me in welcoming director Ian Darrow. Ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, a distinct pleasure to be here. Uh, and I, I have to first start by thanking Art uh, Dietz uh, for his uh, just overall enthusiasm for making this project happen. I think you all know that this is the first in, in this series and it's our inaugural series here at the, the uh, Louisville Free Public Library and I, I, I can't tell you how excited I am to be a part of this family. In fact, we are neighbors. Uh, Jim Blanton and I uh, can look at each other from across Broadway in our offices here, in fact. Uh, so. Without further ado, I, I want to just give you a little taste of, of what we are going to have here uh, is, as a part of this series. Uh, you, I know why you all are here tonight, and that's why I'm here tonight too, and that's for Dr. Hale. Uh, just to also let you know that there are two more parts of this series in conjunction with the remaining two operas in our season, Dead Man Walking, an opera by Jake Heggie, uh, with a story uh, by Sister Helen Prejean. Those two individuals will be part of this series in October 26. Both Jake and Sister Helen will be here, and, and we're very excited. Uh, they will be able to talk to you about the journey that they've been on uh, since they came up with the idea to make an opera about an already established book and movie. Uh, the, the third in the series is a lecture featuring our conductor and director of The Barber of Seville, Robert Tweeton and Matthew Ozawa, and they will discuss bringing together a masterpiece of a certain age uh, and giving it an, an, a, a facelift, if you will, a fresh approach uh, in this new day and age. So marrying new and old with The Barber of Seville and looking at the inspirations that our director, Matthew Ozawa, is pulling from the films of Federico Fellini. Uh, I think that'll be an, another wonderful, interesting uh, conversation that we'll be able to have here. That's in January. So be on the lookout for those. Keep, keep registering uh, as part of uh, your, your duties here in, in the library. It's such a wonderful thing. Uh, for those of you who have not yet bought your tickets to Ariadne of Noxus or perhaps even season tickets to the opera, we have a whole concession stand out there for you. So uh, be sure to uh, fill out the, uh, the, the chance to win two tickets uh, to Ariadne. Uh, otherwise, we also have cards that will give you an additional discount. So please do uh, visit that concession stand uh, before you leave tonight. The singing is going to be amazing this season. Uh, that's the, the thing that I keep driving home to everyone is that you don't have to go very far to get world-class singing. Um, now, without further ado, uh, I, I was uh, introduced to John Hale early in my uh, uh, first month or two here in Kentucky Opera. I just turned one in Louisville, by the way, and I, I could not believe the great fortune in the resource that you all know and love in this community already. Um, John, as you know, has been a professor at the University of Louisville for 35 years now, and uh, the, I, would, I can't even say 
that, it, I, yes, we all know archaeology is his thing, but once you listen to him talk, you realize that that is one of many things. And I am, I'm so excited to tell you that, you know, upon that first meeting, we talked about opera, of course, and his love for opera. And I said, well, we're going to do Ariadne off Noxos. And, and he was, uh, it, the, the eyes just shined. And he said, that's one of my favorite operas. And so that's how it was born. And it was after that conversation, I thought about ways to bring in others uh, for the other operas as well. So it, it's, it's to you, John, that this, this series has... Uh, been created. It's to your credit. And uh, without further ado, I will give you the man who needs no introduction in Louisville, Dr. John Hale. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here and it's wonderful to be talking about Ariadne Alf Naxos. You're looking at a, a photograph of one of my favorite spots in the world. It is the island of Naxos. Some of you have been to Greece, some of you have been lucky as I've been to travel in those realms of gold, the Cycladic Islands that circled Delos, the holy island. Naxos is the biggest one. And Naxos had its grand century about 100 years before Athens did. And through some cataclysm, many remarkable buildings were begun that were never finished and that includes this great temple of Apollo. But I feel that there are temples to Apollo all over the Greek and Roman world. There's only one where all that's left is the door. And it's so evocative of passing out of our time and our world into another age and another life. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want the rest of the temple to be completed. So it is our open door for spending some time looking at what I think is the most unusual opera ever written, an opera based on Greek myths, but based on something that is in this particular myth, the myth of Ariadne, that is in scarcely any other Greek myth. And that is the element of redemption. When all seems lost, when the world seems to have turned against you, when you are alone, when you are about to go under, in this myth, because our heroine has soldiered on, remained true to her ideals, the most dramatic rescue in the history of world mythology takes place. And I believe that that is what recommended it to Strauss for music. I think that's what recommends it to all of us today. Now, if you get away from that big door, you can see that it's like a symbolic gateway to the entire world of the Greek past. It's on a little offshore island from the main harbor at Naxos, and it just invites every visitor, come to me and to gaze, to walk through it, to imagine it as a liminal space between our world and so many other worlds. And I think it makes it easy to understand Richard Strauss in choosing this myth of Ariadne, which takes place entirely on this magical island, how easy it was to feel this is the right place for magic to happen. Richard Strauss was a man who was very interested in Greek myths. We'll be looking at the list of those that he set to music in a moment. But he is someone who was born in the heart of the 19th century and lived right into the middle of the 20th. And he is someone who bridged that gap between the world of Beethoven and Brahms and the world of 20th century music. He, in operas like Electra, used all of the extraordinary resources of the orchestra, of atonality, all of the modern things. But in Ariadne, in keeping with his archeological theme, he looked back almost to Haydn and Mozart in places to an ideal golden age world where everything is harmony. He lived long enough to have his portrait taken by the same sort of photographers who would have photographed Civil War folks over here in the USA, but at the same time to appear on a Time magazine cover in mid 20th century. Behind the public man was a man of very deep feeling. And I think we can see that not only in his face, but in his signature. I like looking at signatures. I am one of those people who believe that your signature is yourself, whether you want it to be or not. 
I don't know a more extraordinary signature than this. He very deliberately breaks connections where they ought to be and very stubbornly connects things that shouldn't be connected at all, like the first and last name. And if anybody in this room would have guessed that the first letter of his first name is R and the last name begins with the letter S, I'll buy you dinner. It's a mark of a complex person. Uh, there are childlike simplicity elements in the character, as you can see in the way A-U-S-S -S tails off the way he must have written it at school when he was 10. But other things have intruded. And Ariadne is just one of many operas where this man who straddled two worlds makes magic happen. So we're gonna be spending some time trying to get into his head, trying to understand this world of musical drama that he created. And we're also going to get back to the myths that made this magical to him. He belonged to an era with people like Freud and others where the Greek myths were paradigms of human experience. Everybody in the English and German and French speaking world grew up knowing those myths. They were a common language and contemporaries of his, Freud, we will play a salute to, just well, let's go ahead and pay our salute to Freud. I don't think you probably knew that Freud's ashes by his request were interred in a Greek vase. That's the vase, that's where his ashes are, and that's the way he wanted it to be. He felt that the Greeks, from whom he borrowed terms like the Oedipus complex for that king of Thebes, who without knowing it, killed his father and married his mother, that the Greeks had the secret to the idea of archetypes, that their myths got beyond individuals and the accidents of history into the true eternal verities of our human existence. Now, in line with Freud's interest in myths, Strauss wrote five mythical operas. By the time he wrote Ariadne, he already had one of his most revolutionary works to his credit, Electra, the very tragic and brutal story of the homecoming of King Agamemnon from the Trojan War, his murder by the mother of Electra, Queen Clytemnestra, and then Electra, this girl who really never knew her father except to see him killed, decides to take vengeance into her own hands. Then comes Ariadne, then Helen, an interesting late myth about Helen where it claimed she didn't go to Troy at all. She was spirited away to Egypt and spent her time during the 10 years of the Trojan War there with the gods in Egypt, leading a very pure and enlightened life. We go on to another heroine, Daphne. This is another transformation. Daphne means laurel. And Daphne was pursued by Apollo and in order to save herself from being taken by Apollo sexually, she asked that she be transformed into a tree. Her father was a river and he was nearby and rivers can apparently do these things when they are gods. So she was, she was transformed into laurels. And that is why Apollo made the laurel his sacred tree and at all the Greek games, people were crowned with laurel as the badge of victory. And finally, another love with a queen and a god, Danae, uh, was lusted after by none other than Zeus, who came to her in a shower of gold because she wouldn't accept him in any other way. So these operas, which span almost, well, a little over 30 years, are at the core of Strauss's work. If you're looking for the big famous opera, that's Der Rosen Cavalier, and that's a salute to Mozart and his time, and one of the most popular operas in the repertoire. None of this would have been possible in terms of opera without somebody to write the words. And Strauss had the incredible good fortune to meet one of the greatest poetically minded and dramatically charged librettists, writers of the book for an opera, in the whole history of this art form. His name was Hugo von Hofmannsthal. As you can see, he's a full generation younger than Strauss. But they saw eye to eye and they collaborated again and again on great works like Ariadne auf Naxos. This is the first edition, and you can see that emblem of what Ariadne is all about in the sweeping drawing on the cover. A lonely figure on a rock far out at sea, the clouds and the wind sweeping by, 
no human company. This is Ariadne. Now, Strauss was not only lucky in his librettist, he was lucky to know one of the most powerful, dramatic singers of any time, Maria Yaritza, J-E-R-I-T-Z-A. And she was his Ariadne, and here he is rehearsing with her. And she may look like she's ready to do the dishes here. She was a very practical person. But once she is in her robes as a princess of the island of Crete, the appearance matched the voice. She was like a force of nature. And when you hear the music that he wrote for Ariadne, if you can imagine one of Wagner's heroines, one of those Valkyries, turned into the most thoughtful, feeling, yearning person. So they've got the command of a goddess, but somehow this emotional core that gods are denied. You've got what he wrote into Ariadne, and from all that we can tell from people who heard her sing, he had in her the perfect interpreter. He carried Ariadne forward to just a few years before his death, continually participating in new productions. Here he is teaching it to a, a great conductor named Bruno Walter, who was very important during my lifetime. And I hadn't realized that he had been able to learn all about Strauss directly from Strauss himself when he would take the baton and start writing about, it, start conducting. Now, I want you to know about the opera because we're not really going to mention it again. We are going back into deep time. We're going into the mythical world. We are going to try to find what Ariadne meant to all these people. We will get a little glimpse of the staging of Ariadne in just a moment. But our main focus is the myth itself. Why did it exert this magical power over this great composer, Richard Strauss, this great writer, young Hugo von Hofmannsthal, to create this masterpiece? And what they brought to it that wasn't in the original Greek myth, and in fact is not in any Greek myth, is a counterpoint. Counterpoint in music means that there's at least two themes going on at once. And in combination, they are both distinct, but they make harmony for each other. You can do simple counterpoint every time you sing row, row, row the boat with somebody else. The counterpoint here is between comedy and the heroic myth. It's still not clear to me where this idea came from, and I don't know why it works, but it does. But when you see Ariadne, you're seeing it in a special frame. The pretense is that you're at a house, a noble house in the 18th century, and a troupe of very serious singing actors, a prima donna and, a, and a, a, her, her troupe, are about to put on Ariadne auf Naxos. You'll actually meet the composer in Act One, who's trying to finish Ariadne auf Naxos. He's a sort of Mozart clone, plays a very important role. But they find out to their chagrin that they have a real low life of a patron. He's a nouveau riche who wasn't brought up to know what's proper. And he's hired two troops for the evening, uh, a Commedia dell'arte group of clowns and the serious opera. Well, it turns out that dinner runs late and the fireworks after dinner cannot be pushed back. So his major dobo comes in at the end of act one to inform the two troops who've been bickering and battling, you're gonna have to present your work simultaneously. So that's what you get in the second half of Ariadne of Naxos, are the serious mythological tale of Ariadne played in counterpoint to the comedies of these clowns. Here is our, our cast of, of harlequins and a principal uh, lady clown named Serbinetta. And it is with these that Ariadne has to share her island. She does not, in fact, interact with them. She makes sure of that, but the music does. The music flows in and out. Why it should be that this injection of slapstick makes the potential tragedy of her story and the ultimate heroic end so much more moving I don't know. It's one of those mysteries of art that this vision that those two geniuses had has turned into a unique work in the entire world of creation. And certainly Ariadne is a role that has, however close it gets to those clowns, inspired some of the greatest of all sopranos to some of their greatest singing. This is Leontine Price, 
as Ariadne. And I have to believe that part of what made Leontine Price so moved by this role is that theme of redemption, of a life that seems lost, but through a seeming miracle is found again. So let's return to our doorway and let's get to know Naxos and the myths behind this extraordinary work that inspired both Strauss and von Hofmannsthal. We're back at our doorway, the doorway that never led to a temple, it just leads to wider spaces of the world. And Naxos itself is kind of a central place. All those green islands there are the Cyclades or Cyclades, that's like in bicycle. They wheel around a central holy island called Delos that was sacred to Apollo, who's the god of musical inspiration. Nobody was allowed to live on Delos. There was a nearby island. Those who tended Apollo's temple lived on that nearby island. And once every spring, when all of the Greeks gathered on Delos for a great celebration in honor of Apollo, the god of music and inspiration, that island became the single biggest city in the Greek world for those days of festival. I know I'm in a room where some people have been to the Cyclades before. And uh, my urging is that all of you who haven't been, once you've seen Ariadne, uh, get in touch with your travel agent and try to get there. I don't know any place on earth that has quite the magic of the Cyclades. You can see scenes like this, these crystalline waters, these distant beaches, the rough rocks of the islands rising up out of the sea, throughout this huge archipelago, this circle of islands. Our focus in the Cyclades is Delos, spelled here the Greek way with an I, modern Greek way, D-E-L-O-S is the way we spell it. That's our sacred island. Mykonos is the ultimate party island. An entire generation of people a generation ago had their wild nights on the beach at Mykonos. And down here is the great island of Naxos, the biggest of the Cyclades. But they all wheel around Delos, and the Greeks felt this is where their world began. After the Trojan War, after the collapse of the Bronze Age kingdoms of Agamemnon and Odysseus and the others, this is where life started up again for the Greeks. These islands were protected by the sea. They have perfect climate. Olives, grapes, wheat, all grow in abundance on these islands. And they have a moat. They have the entire Aegean Sea as a moat. And it was a safe place for those surviving Greeks to live through the centuries it took to regrow their civilization into the classical golden age. It's a rugged island with a real backbone to it a mountain range that plunges into the sea at the north and south ends. The harbor that we were looking at with the door, that's over here on the west side of the island. And for the rest, it's very hard to land on Naxos because the hills plunge straight down into the sea. So that helps funnel all the visitors to that one place. I don't think Strauss knew this when he wrote about it and I don't think the myth makes much of it, but if you're marooned on, on Naxos, you're hard to reach. The, the outside world is kept at a distance. Now we've gotten up in a helicopter and we're looking back over the harbor. There's our portada, our door, and you can see the outline of the temple that was never built. A causeway to the mainland, the lovely whitewashed town of Naxos, and then rising into the sky, the inevitable rocky mountains and hills of any part of the Greek world. Much of Ariadne of Naxos takes place outside her cave. She doesn't have a house, there's no town. She has arrived before Naxos has been settled. So she lives in a cave. Walk around the beach till you see that island. I have to think Strauss knew about this because this is where the caves are and this is the loneliest spot on the island as well. The ancient people loved the sea. Their art is immersed with it. Here's an octopus or squid on a wine jug. And if you walk around Naxos today, all the octopi are strung up, ready to be minced into that night's dinner and grilled for your delectation. Olive trees, that staff of life for the Greeks, flourish on Naxos, but so do something, the almond tree, which doesn't do so well on the mainland. It likes the very temperate climate of Naxos and the grapes. 
those wonderful grapes for Naxian wine. Naxian wine isn't very highly thought of today. They must have lost the recipe because in classical times, the most prized wine of all came from Naxos and was eaten with Naxian almonds. You can see not only from the abandoned temple with only the door standing, but from gigantic statues all over the island that something terrible happened. That there was a day when they just couldn't go on with these projects. If this had been finished, this would have been one of the largest freestanding stone statues in the entire Greek world. You can see his feet down at this end, the arm reaching forward, the head. We don't even know who the, hat, the statue was supposed to represent because it was abandoned when it was just roughed out. Here's another one still in place. This is one of the heroes of Ariadne of Naxos. This is the god Dionysus or Bacchus. I was taught when I was in school, Dionysus is Greek, Bacchus is Latin. It's true Bacchus is Latin, but the Greeks all used that same term. So he's a god with two names. And Euripides, great Greek tragedy called the Bacchae, is about the women who worship the god of wine, the god of altered states, as I like to think of them. Because Dionysus is also the god of actors. And in Greece, when you're an actor, you put on a mask and you pretend to be somebody else. So to me, the connection with wine and acting, you're in an altered state, you're somebody else. And yes, he would have loved our drug culture. So he's, he's somebody that all the responsible parents have trouble feeling is a really worthy god to be up there on Mount Olympus. He shows up on the coins of Naxos. These were minted over in Sicily by some Naxians who left their home island and struck it rich in the golden west of the Greek world. That's a bearded Dionysus on the left. On the obverse, the reverse is his Cantharos, a great jug-like flagon of wine. And many people think this is the most beautiful of all Greek coins, done again by these Naxians in their new home in Sicily, thinking back to their island sacred to Dionysus. That's Dionysus on the left. In later Greek art, we always see him as a beardless youth, sort of the, the teenager who's still a bad boy. But he was originally a very respectable, middle-aged god with a heavy beard and a proper companion for Demeter, that very sacred goddess who's in charge of the wheat and the grain without which human life can't survive. On the obverse then, you see the god's head crowned with ivy leaves. And on the reverse, there is one of his companions. These are goat men. Goats are very be badly behaved creatures. So if you put a goat together with a man and give him an appetite for liquor, you've got trouble. So these were called satyrs. They also were highly oversexed. And here he is holding his wine cup. He's holding it at a position that you would play a game called kotobos at the end of a drinking session. He's going to flick the dregs out of that cup at a target. And whoever hit the target was considered the most sober and the winner of the game. Now, Naxos was also blessed with wonderful white marble. This is a modern quarry on Naxos today. And you are now looking at Naxian marble. Its colorings are white, blue, gray, shading into something like light on a snow field. It is so translucent that if the roof tiles are made thin enough, the, the sun can actually shine through the roof and illuminate the house with a fabulous glow. That beautiful interior landscape of the island is of a temple that did get finished but has been ruined. This is the temple of the goddess Demeter, goddess of grain, the mother goddess of the Greek world. The D-E at the beginning of her name means god or goddess, and the meter, M-E-T-E-R, is mother, maternal. So this was one of her places looking over great fields of wheat, and that's what's left of her temple in that fabulous translucent white marble. It seems to almost glow from within, and this is through the magic of digitalization, the temple put back on its six-column facade, so we get a sense of what it was like. Demeter's? Temples are not ordinary temples. Ordinary temples are houses for God. Only priests and priestesses go in. There's an altar out front, and you put a gift on the God's altar. With one hopes a little more reverence than you pay your insurance premium, but that's what it is. You're paying for good things. Demeter didn't like that. 
Her temples were places people came in, especially women, and joined in communal rituals and celebrations. And Naxos is so far from the mainland and the lights of Athens and the other cities that this was only taken a few years ago. Even today, on a winter night, you can see the Milky Way in all of its glory on Naxos. Now, they took their marble far and wide. They went to Delphi, the site of the Delphic Oracle, and they created a sphinx, a female sphinx, to stand on a tall column at Delphi so everyone would know how much the people of Naxos revered Apollo, who was the god at Delphi. That's what she would have looked like when she still had her gilding and her silver plate on. But there she is in the very heart of the whole Delphic sanctuary, the single most imposing monument of all, a gift from these fabulously wealthy, fabulously devout people of Naxos. But they, it has been discovered by archaeologists, had a cult thousands of years before the Olympian gods appeared on the scene, Zeus and Hera and Apollo and Demeter. They worshiped a goddess that we call the Great Mother because we do not know her name. But she dates to a time when farmers began to appear on the scene and Zeus and the other sky gods of weather somehow seemed less important than Mother Earth herself. And for a brief period, and it happens all over the world in places where people turn to agriculture, the first new agricultural religions center around female deities, mother goddesses, mother earth herself. That's Naxian marble put to a different use to create one of these figures that are called Venus figures. The 19th century called them that because you see the sexual parts. It's probably much more accurate to think of them as mother goddesses, Greeks did not have our hang-ups with nakedness, but we have an extraordinary series of these from Naxos. And given that Ariadne is going to turn out to be a very empowered female mythological figure, given that by the end she will have become a consort of a god, and actually her crown will be a constellation, it seems appropriate that her island Naxos should have been a place that early on put female mystical sacred power at the top. There you see the elements of most of these Venus figurines, not just from Naxos, but all over the Greek world. Extraordinary stylization and simplification, and yet in unexpected places, lots of detail. The sculptor wanted you darn well to know she had 10 toes, and they're all there. That triangle is her pubic area, the slit for the vagina. She's a mother. You, mothers must be sexually fecund and productive of new life. The breasts are also emphasized. And then there's that strange thing, the crossing of the arms under the breast. For us, this is a sign of boredom, impatience, reserving judgment. I'm seeing some out there right now. <laughs> Whatever it meant to them, it didn't mean any of those things. This is one of those secret mysteries of the past that we don't know what the Rosetta Stone would be to explain why do these mother figures so often have their hands folded that way. Here, the abstraction has gotten to the point where if you hadn't seen some before, you might not be sure that was a human figure. They are millennia ahead of their time when it comes to not caring if the thing looks like the physical object or not, and they wouldn't have said it's art. They would have said it's a sacred thing. It's the goddess. Front and back, she almost looks cold here. Only on Naxos, which makes it seem this may be the center of her cult, which goes all over the Greek world, do we find the mother goddess enthroned. She is on a chair, a throne. She still has her arms in that very characteristic folded position. And she is receiving worshipers like us. She is supreme and above ordinary things of human life. Her stylization transcends ordinary human emotions. She's something eternal, and she belongs to this special world of Ariadne's island, Naxos. So we are looking at a Cycladic figurine 
from Naxos, goes all the way back to the Bronze Age. She may be a priestess, she may be a queen, she may be a goddess herself, or a woman, a mortal woman, playing all of those roles. Now in time, that old religion of Naxos went away, and its place was taken by a new faith that is still there in Greece, the faith of Christianity. But when you see those whitewashed churches of Naxos hanging up there on their cliffs, you feel that some of that old aesthetic of the simplicity, of the shining, blinding light and whiteness carried over from their pre-Christian world into their churches today. Certainly churches give you stories of redemption. The whole Christian faith is a story about redemption. But those Greek myths, Homer, all of the Greek tradition, Redemption's almost unknown. So when I look at these Naxian churches, I feel like this is a place where there was a pre-echo of the world that we have gotten to know through our religions. Now, when the Romans came to Naxos, they built big country houses and they had beautiful mosaics. And they liked to put myths on the mosaics. This is a myth in Naxos, and it's the myth that goes back to Ariadne's grandmother and how she got to be on Crete. This is the myth of Europa and the bull. Europa is very sketchily represented below the navel, but the bull is very clear, and he is Zeus in mortal disguise. He's picked yet another target among the living females of the earth, and for Europa, he has carried her away on his back. She was a princess of the city of Tyre. Tyre and Sidon and Byblos are cities of the, the Canaanites we call Phoenicians, way off in what is today Lebanon. They were great seafarers, wealthy kings. Europa, at that time, that was just her name. She's going to give her name to the continent of Europe. She was playing with friends down by the seashore. Zeus saw her and lusted after her. So he turned himself into a big, beautiful, white bull and he came up out of the sea and all the other girls ran away but Europa well she's a princess she's the daughter of kings she she meets the bull on his own ground and the bull kneels down and she climbs right on his back and he wades out into the sea and swims away with her he swims all the way to Crete and as you can see that's a long way she stuck on his back when they got to Crete. They mated, and she had a son who was the son of Zeus and also the grandson of the king of Phoenicia, the king of Tyre. They called him Minos, M-I-N-O-S. We name our, our common term for the civilization of Crete after Minos and his descendants. It was the title of the kings, to be Minos. The Minoan civilization is named for this union of Europa, and Zeus, and yes, the Greeks always said, we call the continent Europa because of her. Now out of that comes a great mythic cycle. I don't like text slides, but every ball game needs that, that, that program. So just so you're with it. This giant cycle starts when Zeus turns himself into a bull. Bulls are going to run all the way through this and takes... Europa from Tyre, westward to Crete. They have children and one of them is named Minos, the firstborn son, and he's going to become king of Crete, the island where he was born. He takes a woman as wife, Pasiphae. Apparently, although they have children, he's not satisfying her because in the second yellow line down, as you will say, Pasiphae falls in love with a bull seems to kind of run in the family. And it's a, a great big bull, and they're not sure how they're going to manage this, and I'm relieved to see uh, no one under about the age of 18 in this room. So uh, there's a court engineer and inventor, a sort of Leonardo da Vinci type. His name is Daedalus, and he is a, a Greek from the mainland. He has a son named Icarus, and they don't like working for Minos. They're virtually prisoners on the island of Crete, but the pay is good and his armies are strong and they're not gonna try to leave. To stick with them and, and give you the, the rest of the myth of Daedalus, they ultimately fashion 
wings of feathers and wax and they fly away. They fly away to Sicily. But young Icarus doesn't pay attention to his father. Typical teenager. He's only been told one thing not to do. Don't fly too near the sun. Would it be so much to ask one thing? Of course, the first thing he does is fly up as high as he can. The wax melts, his feathers disintegrate, and he falls in the sea and is drowned. One of the great paintings by the, the Flemish painter Bruegel is a scene called The Fall of Icarus. It's a, it's a canvas about the size of that wall, and Icarus is about this big. It's one of Bruegel's jokes. Everybody, all the, all the ships are going off on their business, and the farmers are plowing the fields, and there's Icarus falling in the sea. So Daedalus does get away, but he has left behind a place that was created to keep the the, well, first of all, he, he made it possible for Pasiphae to mate with a bull. She has a son who is half man, half bull, and he's right there in the middle, the, the Minotaur. Daedalus, before he leaves, builds a labyrinth, a maze, so the Minotaur can be lost in the maze and never find his way out, but he's not technically in prison. And Athens has been calling, causing trouble to Crete, so to keep Athens in line, the king of Crete, Minos, demands that regularly Athens will send him nine youths and nine maidens to feed to the Minotaur because this is a very unusual bull. He's carnivorous. And so they are pushed into the labyrinth. They lose their way in the maze and they're eaten. Europa carried away by Zeus. Uh, I like this uh, very charming uh, Greek red figure vase where the look on Zeus's face is clearly that of the guy who's about to get his way. Another reference to ancient art, uh, this is a wonderful Roman mosaic that shows uh, a very spirited bull uh, charging away with Europa into the sea. She seems very collected and on top of the, the situation. And this is just to remind you of the great voyage. Lebanon here, Crete here, and it's here that Zeus brings Europa and now fathers children with Europa, Minos, and then that line that will descend from Minos. Europa, of course, is a mortal. We're gonna run into this problem with Ariadne. She is a mortal woman. The god can love her, the god Dionysus does, just as Zeus loved Europa, but he can't give her immortality. So our modern uh, astronomers have done something for Europa that Zeus forgot to do. They made one of the moons of the planet Jupiter, which would be Zeus to the Greeks, Europa. So you're looking at her immortal uh, self up there in the sky. And just to pick up again the story, this is Daedalus presenting the, the contraption, the cow, the white cow in which Pasiphae, the queen, will hide herself. She's fallen in love with a big white bull. She will have sex with the bull in this machine. And the result, nine months later, or whatever is the gestation period for a half child, half bull, arrives, this is my favorite red figure, Greek vase. Um, I mean, somebody really had a sense of humor here. Um, here's our little minotaur, head of a bull, um, body of a, of a young man. Uh, not really very fearsome, but of course he's still just a kid. Modern artists have gotten at the Minotaur. This next one is one of many you can, you can find in galleries um, that emphasize the fearsomeness of this, this beast, this uh, carnivorous man now with the, the head of a bull who must have the flesh of his fellow mortals if he's to survive. Ultimately, this labyrinth became the brand for Knossos. In classical times, they didn't know where the labyrinth was, but they sure as heck cashed in. They put it on every coin they minted. And on some of them, it almost looks like that thing you'd find in the newspaper to pass the time with, of finding your way through the maze. It was an obsession in the classical world, but nobody was sure whether the labyrinth had ever really existed or not. Certainly, the Minotaur had not. and It was an open question. So we now have to picture the poor Minotaur stuck in the labyrinth, waiting for those youths and maidens to show up in their ship from Athens so he'll have something to eat. Meanwhile, back in Athens, we've got a young prince named Theseus who's going to be talked about when you go to Ariadne all through the opera. 
He's the man she's waiting for. That's the redemption she's hoping for, that Theseus will come and rescue her from the island of Naxos. Theseus began as a boy who didn't know who his father was. His father was actually king of Athens. But his father, Aegeus, A-E-G-E-U-S, Aegeus, like in a G and C, he had been told by the Delphic Oracle that it would be unlucky for him to raise a son. That son would one day displace him as king rather than waiting for his death. It never pays to try to thwart the Delphic Oracle. Uh, Aegeus left the baby boy with this woman across the sea from Athens in the Peloponnese at Troyzen. He was brought up not knowing who he was, but when he came of age, his mother showed him a heavy stone underneath was a sword and a pair of sandals. And his father had left those there for his son and said when he's strong enough to lift the stone, he's strong enough to put these on and join me in Athens. So you then see in the, this map, a series of little dots from Troizen in the Peloponnese. All these are adventures, monsters and giants that Theseus killed on his way to Athens. He's a regular Jack the Giant Killer avatar. And when he gets to Athens, he's able to prove he is the rightful son of the king and should be the next king. Well, he's present in Athens when the ship arrives from Crete demanding the nine Athenian maidens and the nine Athenian men for the Minotaur. And he asks his father to let him go. None of them have ever come back in the past. They've all been fed into the labyrinth and devoured. Theseus is convinced that he can break this curse and kill the Minotaur. And for those episodes, I want to switch to an extraordinary work in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. There was somebody in the Roman world that loved this myth of Theseus and Ariadne, maybe because it is a myth of redemption. And on their sarcophagus, that's the sarcophagus lengthways running across the top and the two ends on either side of the text, this Roman had the artist carve all the scenes from the story of Theseus and Ariadne and the Minotaur. So let's look at these wonderful Roman pictures close up. There are a lot of images, ancient and modern, that show Theseus meeting Ariadne outside the door to the labyrinth. She's holding in her left hand a ball of twine or yarn, a thread. The ancient name for that is a clue, C-L-E-W. If you read enough Hornblower and, and uh, Aubrey and Maturin stories, they come to points where they clue up the braces, and that's to haul on the lines because that's an old name for a rope or, or twine. In her right hand, she's offering the end to him and explaining, tie it to the door, you will always be able to find your way out. I like the way the artist has made Theseus not look like a, a heroic young, a young youth, but I don't know, traveling salesman, something. A guy on the make, a guy who's, who's with this right from the word go. Now, labyrinth is a genuine Cretan word. The Minoan language has not been deciphered yet or translated, and it's written in a script called Linear A. We can't read that. But it is known that certain place names had Minoan terms in them. Labrys is a double axe, and all over, sites on Crete, the Bronze Age sites associated with the real King Minos, you see this branding, this double axe, as a symbol. So he goes into the labyrinth. She's given him the, the thread. She also gave him a sword. She's prepared, even if he's not. And... The Roman world loved to create mazes like we have in our daily newspapers so people could thread their way around the garden plot or the patio on a maze. These labyrinths show up all over the Roman world. Here they've given you a little clue because there's Theseus inside the maze smiting with a club, the poor Minotaur, and you can see that would take a long time to get out of if you didn't have your, your thread. More scenes there, the ship that is going to carry Theseus and Ariadne away is at the top. So there's our Theseus and Minotaur in that Roman maze. Here's another one, a little more graphic, where the cudgel is pounding the poor Minotaur to death. I'm not sure it even looks like a fair fight in this one. And uh, again, a personal favorite, suffocating the poor Minotaur. What? What is going on here? But he's got the sword ready to kill him, and he's going to dispatch the Minotaur and end the Athenian servitor to, to Crete. Here we're back to our Roman sarcophagus. He's just beaten the, the Minotaur who's 
not much bigger than he is. So Theseus then makes a run for the harbor, scoops up Ariadne en route, gets back to the ship, rams the vessels of the king of Crete so they will be unseaworthy and can't follow him and heads north. He heads north to this island of Naxos where we've spent some time and we know where he's going. They land on Naxos. It's been a long voyage. Ariadne goes to sleep. Athena appears to Theseus. Athena is the goddess of Athens. He's the heir apparent to the Athenian throne. He's needed at home. Enough of this pagan princess. Get a move on. And so without waiting to say goodbye, uh, he leaves. He leaves her sleeping. Now that, that thing with the arm draped over the head of the sleeping woman, that's the little iconographic clue, you're looking at Ariadne. They recently found a Roman site. There was a, a female with the arm over the head. They didn't need a label. Ariadne, many centuries after her own adventure, still an emblem of patient waiting. Now, Theseus paid a terrible price for his haste to get home. This is where he's headed for, Cape Sunio, at the tip of Attica, the land of Athens. I know some of you have been there. There's a great temple of Poseidon there now. But sheer cliffs plunge into the Aegean Sea. Aegeus, the king, had told Theseus before he left, you are going with the traditional black sail that we always put on the ship that carries our youths and maidens to the labyrinth. If you survive, against all odds, please take down that black sail. I will be watching every day. So, in a beautiful illustration from a child's version of this story, there was Aegeus up there on the cliff and there came Theseus' ship. And so much had happened and perhaps he was still thinking about Ariadne, he forgot to change the sail. And that was fatal. The Aegean got its name from this. It means the sea of King Aegeus because he jumped from that great height, as he said he would, killed himself in the sea rather than face life knowing he had sent his son to his death. And Theseus became king of Athens in his father's place. Now back on Naxos, this is another Roman fresco. They really like this story. As I said, it's the only redemptive one. It's like a happy ending where you don't expect one. She's crying. And she's being comforted by the only beings that live on the island who are wood nymphs and water nymphs. They're going to show up in the opera if you see them. They are the commentators on Ariadne's loneliness during the first part of the opera. So we got to go to another sarcophagus to get the Roman visual version of the rest of the story. Dionysus, this new god. He has a mortal mother. Semele is her name. Zeus wanted her after he'd finished with Europa. Uh, Semele never ask a god for anything. Uh, she asked if she could have one favor and he promised her. And she said, swear on the river Styx. So he promised Semele on the, he, on the river Styx he would grant her wish, which he, he thought would be something simple like all the gold in the world or something doable. And she said, I want to see you in your own form. Now gods don't present themselves to mortals in their own form. Form and he tried to talk her out of it, but he'd sworn by the river Styx, and when he showed her his true godly self, she was incinerated. Out of the ashes of Semele, he snatched the little embryo of the child and brought it up, and that became Dionysus, who grew up without a mother or a father. He was raised not quite by wolves, but by the wild folk that live in the countryside, and as I said, became the god of altered states. That's him in the middle with the arm of a boon companion draped around his shoulders, the god traveling the world, spreading the cult of wine. And here is a close-up. He's over on the left now, and he's looking down, and there's Ariadne, the arm over her head. But who is that that she's leaning against? Who's the one being she found in her isolation with whom she's seeking comfort now? Thanatos is his name. He is the god of death. And Dionysus has showed up at the, the god of death. And uh, our Ariadne in the opera will call on death many times. So he has come and is trying to uh, 
give her the release that she longs for. Uh, a great painting by Titian is something that you may have seen before. It's his greatest work. It's this moment of the arrival of Dionysus, not looking like a dissolute frat boy like on that Roman sarc sarcophagus, but looking like an impetuous god, looking like a son of Zeus. He's accompanied to Naxos by his whole train of satyrs and nymphs and other revelers in wine and altered states. But as soon as he sees Ariadne, he flings himself out of his chariot to make himself hers and her his. This painting has so many wonderful things. I really love the two leopards who pull the chariot who are plainly talking it all over. What <laughs> this time? And then Titian's most original signature for any of his paintings is he takes one of the great drinking cups that's fallen off Dionysus chariot and has written Titianos, Titian, this belongs to me on the, on the cup. Ariadne is, as you can see, making good. Artists, the Greek world, the Roman world, the Renaissance, our own time, are drawn to Ariadne in a way that might not have seemed anticipated from this passive being that she seemed to be once she got on the island, just drooping away there. Here to show her now as the, the sort of queen of the court of Dionysus in her, her white, untanned, princess-like state. Uh, I, I really like this one for Dionysus. It really looks like he's calling for a refill, you know? <laughs> Leaning over his shoulder and saying, hey, I'm empty here. Um, perhaps a little more tender and conjugal is this drinking cup where we actually see, this is almost the only image I know of a young married couple in love and looking happy from all of Greek art. And partly it's because women were brought up as such cloistered beings, they really couldn't have anything in common with their husbands except the, the marriage bed and the kids. Well, that's not true of Ariadne. She's a heroine, remember. She's been in charge of the labyrinth. She's enabled a hero to, to kill the beast. And so she and Dionysus get along just fine. Now, what is the archeological evidence for this whole story? A labyrinth, Minotaur, Crete is this all-powerful place. It turns out there's plenty. And we got a timeline here that takes us from the first Neolithic farmers settling in Crete, all the way down to the Trojan War and the collapse of the Bronze Age civilizations. And in this action-packed set of millennia, most of the historical things happened that gave rise to the myth of Ariadne, of Crete, Theseus, of Athens, and this god, Dionysus, appearing in the world. As soon as people began to dig on Crete, starting with just farmers, they found gold all over this island. This is a gold ring, and it has a scene that shows, not a minotaur, but a genuine living bull, but a young acrobat leaping over the bull's back. This was found near Knossos. Knossos is right in the center of the island of Crete, facing to the north shore, which is approachable. The south shore that faces toward Egypt and the south of, of the Mediterranean is almost inaccessible and is the guarding place for Crete because ships can't land except if they come around to the port for Knossos. Tucked away in the interior of Crete are some of the loveliest valleys in the entire Mediterranean world. The soil is rich and fertile, full of wildflowers. They found many uses for poppies, crocuses, and the cave where Zeus was born is located on, on Crete. Here, here he was nursed by local nymphs as he was hiding out from his father Kronos, time, who wanted to eliminate this troublesome offspring. Crete is divided through its north-south axis by a great Samaria Gorge, one of the great hikes in the world. Truly a magical landscape, even the bridges and seasonal torrents are beautiful on Crete. <coughs> everywhere are flowers, everywhere is that luminous sea. It seems appropriate that Crete should be the place where we find the world's oldest olive tree. And one of the oldest trees on earth, this is 5,000 years old. And this, since that's when, in 3000 BC, the first farmers came from what is today Turkey with olives to plant them on Crete, this may be actually 
a tree surviving from that first visit planted by one of those Neolithic farmers' hands. These Anatolians knew the secret of the olive. If you've got the olive and you've also got grain and an occasional bit of meat from a sacrifice once every few weeks, and you've got the grape for vitamins, you've got a fully balanced diet. And the meat, if you get it as a man will, head of the table, gives you those jolts of energy you need to go out and be a warrior as well. But people lived long in Crete. It was a paradise-like place. And we have lovely images of the olive harvests with the, the people up in the trees with their sticks, wrapping the branches and dropping the autumns down on the ground in the, in the, in the autumn time. To Crete there came an archeologist, the guy you see on the right there. He was from Oxford. He was a British collector of antiquities and fortunately the heir to a really substantial fortune. His name is, at this point, just Arthur Evans. He's going to become Sir Arthur Evans. He'll be knighted for all the archeological work he does, looking for Ariadne, looking for the labyrinth, looking for the Minotaur. He was inspired by a German named Heinrich Schliemann. Heinrich Schliemann was an orphan who grew up dirt poor with a fire in his belly through hard work, he managed to become a businessman. He managed to corner the world market on a number of different minerals and became a man so rich that he was able to travel the world and devote the rest of his life to archeology. span He married a Greek girl, 17 years old, Sophia, wisdom is her name, Sophia Schliemann she became, and together they tackled places like Troy, and that was the inspiration that Sir Arthur Evans needed because he had read Greek myths when he was a kid and was told they're just myths. They're just stories. And then he would pick up newspapers and see this guy that you see on the left there, Heinrich Schliemann, finding Troy, finding Agamemnon's tomb at Mycenae, finding archaeological remains that show that there's a reality behind these myths. This is the scene at Troy after Schliemann had dug all the overburden off, the great walls of Troy where King Priam watched the fighting on the plain below between the Greeks and his sons Hector and Paris. And Homer had always said Troy was golden. We now know that this is a thousand years earlier than the Troy of the Trojan War, but deep down in the mound there was an earlier Troy filled with gold, and that's Sophia Schliemann, Heinrich's wife, draped in the gold of Troy. We probably wouldn't do that today in one of the most famous archeological images of the 19th century. So inspired by this idea, Sir Arthur Evans, who was interested in Crete and believed there had to be some historical kernel of truth behind the idea of a Minos who ruled Athens and the other Greek cities from this island, behind the importance of bulls, behind a woman named Ariadne, he managed to get the permit to excavate at Knossos. The name had never been forgotten and that was the name of the palace where Ariadne had lived. He got the permit by buying the site. So it, it pays to be the heir to a fortune if you want to be a lucky 19th century archeologist. Here he is in, as a young man at the time he first went to Crete. There he is as the great uh, old hero of Bronze Age excavation holding one of the bull's heads that he found at Crete, but he is the one responsible for unearthing the Bronze Age civilizations that lie behind the Ariadne myth. The Minotaur turns out to have been a myth. There was no half man, half bull, but bulls were everywhere. Clearly this was a place where young people, at first when he saw this fresco, he thought the bull was trying to kill them. Maybe that's in the bull's mind, but they are clearly athletes dancing with the bull. He worked his way down through the layers of Knossos and ultimately had the whole thing cleared off right down to its pavements. Knossos, like most Mediterranean places, was stone, sockles, or starter walls, and then mud brick up to the roof and tiles protecting that mud brick, that adobe from the winter rains. In these images, you see exciting moments from working down in Ariadne's palace at Knossos. The realization that it truly was a palace, even to a throne. Is this where she sat? Is this where her father 
Minos sat when he was delivering his judgments. It was also clearly a huge collection center for wealth. People paid their taxes in produce. There were no coins in the Bronze Age and they had enough gigantic jars, they're Alibaba type jars, everybody, anybody in this room could fit in one of these jars and hide out like one of the 40 thieves. This is where the olives, this is where the wheat, this is where the grapes and the wine were kept for a whole kingdom, a whole island in these fabulous jars. And even though they're strictly utilitarian, these are Greeks, they just can't help dressing them up. They apparently had to be surrounded by ropes so they could be hoisted once they were full and they've just worked the ropes into a design on the outside of each jar. Back to that little throne, it turned out when they reconstructed the site not to be in a courtyard, but to be in an enclosed room. There were griffins on the wall, divine beasts, royal beasts, bodies of lion, the heads of eagles. The throne itself, unique at this time period anywhere in the world. We don't even have thrones for Egyptian pharaohs at this time and some sort of basin in front. Guarded by the griffins, whoever sat on that throne was a semi-divine person. So the original idea when they first reconstructed the room that it was a hanging out place for the women, once they put all this together, they realized this is a throne room. And whether Ariadne represents the fact that this is a place where women ruled, or whether it was the throne room of a young king a Minos, a young athletic type who ruled his people, still up for grabs. Many of you have been to Knossos, you've seen the extraordinary architecture, those strange columns that taper to the bottom rather than to the top, unique in the world. The brilliant colors, Sir Arthur Evans even found some of the bright red on those columns when he looked at it under the mic magnifying glass. And I think maybe you can just see there's a charging bull on the fresco behind. You can see his yellow horn projecting forward from the head. It turned out to have been three and four stories high in places. This was a tremendously sophisticated spot, covered with artworks, covering an entire hilltop. In some ways it looks very simple, like our own Pueblo tradition down in the American Southwest. Party walls, a whole community living together, but Pueblos, although they do have underground kivas for the men to get together for worship, there's no throne room at a Pueblo. Nobody's in charge at a Pueblo, as they clearly are at Knossos. This is a royal center. And finally, Evans suggested that the myth of the labyrinth came from later Greeks coming to the ruins of Knossos, seeing this maze of rooms, seeing bull images everywhere, and making up the story. They liked their dolphins, but what Evans was really struck by again was the prevalence of women in the art, empowered women, women bearing their breasts, women who weren't any man's chattel. Ariadne, he imagined, was just such a woman. He began to hire artists to do, draw images of what court life might have been like for these most liberated women of the entire ancient world. They were far more frequently pictured than the men, and when men were shown, they were often shown adoring or making offerings to a woman. This sort of helped put Ariadne in a completely new context. The idea that she would become the consort of a god no longer seemed something simply of myth. The women were elaborately coiffed and garbed, and they were the mistresses of beasts, including snakes. So here she is holding serpents in her hands and receiving these gifts from the men. Now, we saw those poppies earlier. Hallucinogens played some part in this religion. They often do for people who want to travel to the next world and meet the gods. That's a crown of poppy seed pods. That should say P-O-D, not P-O-T. The slit is for the juice to come out and dry and form the opium. And in the uh, picture, this is the position for hailing a god this person, thanks to the opium, can now see the gods, can now commune with the supernatural. Now it turned out that having dug it at Knossos, Evans sponsored other people to dig elsewhere. There were palaces all over Crete. And if we look at this image of the palace at Malia, I think we get at what he was thinking about the maze of the rooms. Later Greeks would have seen it like this. No roofs, no upper walls, all of these passageways and rooms and staircases and then a central open space. 
Could this be, with its offering discs and its vineyards, could this be the kind of place that started Greeks thinking about a different kind of building, a labyrinth, and not understanding that this was a peaceful place, as was Festos, where writing was discovered, lots and lots of tablets, that in fact, the Minotaur was a sacred bull, an emblem of Crete, and when he saw these images of young men and women vaulting over the bull's back, dancing with the bulls, and a modern artist has taken all these images and shown you what they're doing, it seemed possible but that the whole story of the Minotaur had somehow been gotten wrong. Probably young people from all over the Greek world came here. This is the most civilized, wealthy place. But they probably came as acrobats, dancers, people to take part in these games. Believe it or not, in parts of the Mediterranean, this ancient Minoan Cretan tradition still goes on. Go to Iberia, mainly Portugal, and it's still happening. Minoan bull dancers themselves got all the way down to Egypt. These two panels were found in the Nile Delta. Maybe this was the Minoan embassy, but Egyptians were aware of this also. And a little possible contemporary of Ariadne from Knossos. So when we look at these bull dancers, we're looking at something that later Greeks couldn't understand. When we look at the maze-like palaces of, of Crete, we're looking at something that later Greeks could not understand. And it seems very likely that as they found these emblems of double axes, of strange goddesses and women, supernatural looking insects, octopi, all the rest of it, that those later Greeks wove around these monuments, which they discovered long before Sir Arthur Evans did, but which were already ruins to them, they invented these myths to go with the pictures. Knossos didn't last long after the Mycenaean Greeks came down and conquered it after the Trojan War, and nothing lasted long of the Bronze Age after that. Uh, they were invaded by peoples of the sea. We don't know who they are. Troy, Knossos, all the Bronze Age palaces and cities were put to the torch. The mud brick collapsed, their treasures were buried, and age ended. And the New Age, the Iron Age, where they had hotter furnaces to smelt the iron ore, was at hand. What kept the memories alive? musicians, singers of tales, pipers, harpists. They would tell the stories. I, I just put in the, the acrobats because it's so unusual but they're from the same cycladic period. They would harp away and out of their tradition grew the man we call Homer, the fellow who put the story of the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Trojan War, the adventures of Odysseus and the other kings coming home, put them into verse, put them into song, and then travel the Greek world, reminding all the Greeks there were people here before you. There was another world before this one, and thus the Trojan War, Crete, all of that foreworld was remembered. I want to end with that wonderful Titian painting. Here he is, young Bacchus, hurling himself out of his chariot at the first strong emotion for another being that he's ever felt. Ariadne dodging away. There's a constellation that has just been created by him in the sky above her. This is the constellation that was the Greek, called by the Greeks Corona, the crown. And we call it Corona Borealis because there's another Corona in the southern hemisphere. And there it is up in the upper left-hand corner of Titian's painting. Tintoretto did the same scene of Bacchus approaching Ariadne very humbly on the island of Naxos while Aphrodite holds the crown over Ariadne's head and cements the union of these two very different people. So you can go out any night and see it yourself. Her constellation, it's very close to the Big Dipper, very close to the, the, uh, the dog star Corona, the crown of Ariadne. It is obligatory in archeological presentations to end with a sunset. We are going back to our starting point on Naxos, where all this magical story began. And we are now looking through that doorway to nowhere and seeing it is in fact a doorway to somewhere. It is a doorway to memories of adventures on this magical sea that stretch back thousands of years, but in which each one of us can still have a chance to play a part. Thank you.